Well, good morning. Yes, it's me, Kenny Polcari, your host of the party. And today is Thursday, June 20th, 2024. And here are the things that you need to know to get your day started. Well, last week uh, on Tuesday, excuse me, not last week, Tuesday, because yesterday was a holiday. We had the Fed heads urging continued caution, yet leaving the door ajar. Traders, though, continue to push for multiple rate cuts. Investors continue to push on NVIDIA, as well as the S&P rebalancing will push NVIDIA higher, too, as we move into the end of the week. Oil and gold are holding steady and the VIX is near historic lows. And what do we have for dinner tonight? Well, we're having the spaghetti con salsa cipolle cremolata, which is which is caramelized Vidalia onion sauce. Oh my God, it's so delicious. Okay, so look, stocks rose on Tuesday in what was a light volume day ahead of the Juneteenth holiday yesterday. The ongoing rally in, uh, in the chip makers and tech uh, driving the S&P and the NASDAQ to yet another new record high as the trader types continue to push for multiple rate cuts uh, before the year end, right? And in fact, some of them continue to push for the cuts as soon as that July, September timeframe, uh, which has been clearly denied by all the Fed heads that are out there talking, but the trader types are not buying it, right? Um, and they're betting that the coming cuts are going to come sooner rather than later, and they're going to continue to power this most recent rally. Now, speaking of the chorus of Fed heads that came out last week, um, we learned that they're all urging patience falling in line with what Minneapolis Fed President Neely Kashkari said last week, right? Fed Governor Adriana Kugler uh, telling us that uh, uh, it would be appropriate for the Fed to cut rates sometime later this year without committing to a date. St. Louis uh, Bertie Mussolini, right, told us in his first walk down the runway that it could take quarters, plural, for the data to support a cut in his mind. Johnny Williams and Tommy Barkin are underscoring the need for more data before committing to a specific date. So no one's committing anything. Neil Kashkari is the only one that committed to kind of a December thing, right? All of this suggesting that the J July, September timeframe is not in the cards, but a November, December timeframe could be. And I say could be because I continue to believe uh, that we don't need a rate cut, right? But I'm not on the FOMC committee, so I don't get to vote. In any event, the idea that the rate cut is still alive and well is going to continue to uh, drive the sentiment, right? It will be the Fed uh, it will be only if the Fed says that we're not going to get a rate cut that's going to change the mind, and that will cause some angst for sure. At the end of the day, we saw the Dow add 57 points, the S&P was up 13, the NASDAQ gained 5, the Russell gained 3, the Transports actually lost 35 points, while the equal weighted S&P gained 18 points. Now, we're only 19 points away from the next S&P century mark, which is 5,500. And it appears that if futures hold, we're going to see 5,500 at about 9.30 this morning. Recall, we started the year at 47.82. It took us 12 days to pierce 4,800. It took another 15 days to pierce 4,900. On February 8th, it was uh, 5,000. It was 5,100 on February 29th. It was 5,200 on March 20th. It was 5,300 on, uh, on May 15th. And then June 12th brought us 5,400 leaving many to ask how long before we see 5,500. And it appears today's the day. Now, the move up has been driven by uh, the companies that are driving this tech revolution. NVIDIA uh, at $3.35 trillion valuation is now at the top of the list, right? With some even calling for a $5 trillion valuation uh, in the next 12 months. Uh, it is now the most valuable company in the S&P 500, pushing Microsoft at $3.32 trillion aside on, on Tuesday, leaving Apple at $3.285 trillion in third place. Right? It's been nothing short of amazing, but then you have to, uh, but then you have to ask, um, have you used AI recently? Do you understand what it is and how it's changing the world? On the other hand, are we setting ourselves up for a disaster? Have we set the expectations way too high for AI? Do you realize how the rapid ascension of the video only makes it harder to keep it up, right? As it, as it has become something of a mania, something that everyone you know is talking about in video, which is in itself a warning signal. I mean, recall the dot-com bubble back in the late 90s, right? Every New York City cab driver that was telling you how they were making money hand over fist, right? How will Jensen Huang, the CEO at NVIDIA, sustain the goals, the growth? Are companies so misguided that, they, that they've, uh, they've warped expectations? 
uh, for how generative AI is going to contribute to the bottom line. Google tells us that the proportion of global companies planning to decrease spending on AI in the next 12 months has slipped from 63 from um, to 63 percent down from 93 percent. Right, the decline in result of the AI hallucinations, which is the information that's completely inaccurate or misleading or entirely fabricated. It's also cost and it's also data security data security concerns. Right, the survey done by uh, LucidWorks. Right? So many questions though, and not enough answers yet. On the economic front, we got more mixed news. Retail sales came in weaker at plus one tenth of a percent versus the expectation of plus three tenths. Autos was, uh, X autos was negative a tenth of a percent. Uh, X autos and gas was plus one tenth versus the expectation of plus four tenths. And by the way, last month's reads uh, were all revised lower, something, uh, uh, something that only supports the argument that the Fed needs to cut rates sooner, right? Because it's weaker, which is interesting because as my friend Jimmy Urio tells me, uh, and he told us on Twitter last week, every piece of economic data is revised downward after it leaves the public's eye and every expense is revised upward after it leaves the public eye, hoping that nobody gets a chance to see it. Now, note the, the, the revisions above that I already told you about. And then over the weekend, we heard that the Congressional Budget Office uh, just revised the 2024 U.S. budget deficit from $1.5 trillion to $1.9 trillion, which is only a 27% miscalculation. So apparently nobody's really worried about it. On the other side, uh, we've seen we saw strength in industrial production, which came in uh, much stronger than the estimate at plus nine tenths versus the expected estimate of three tenths. Capacity utilization also coming in a bit stronger at 78.7, inching closer to that 80 percent mark, which begins to suggest more upward pressure on prices and inflation. And that would argue for no rate cut at the moment. As of Tuesday evening, we have Infotech way out in front at plus 31.5%. Communications up 23% on the year. Then we have a drop to single digits. Financials up 9%. Consumer staples up 8.5%. Utilities up 8.5%. Industrials up 7%. Healthcare up 6.6%. Energies up 5%. Basic materials up 4%. Consumer discretionary up 3%. And real estate, the only one in negative territory, down 5%. Down the line, the best performing subsectors within the S&P include the semis, right? They're blowing it out of the water at, at up 90%. Think names like NVIDIA is up 175, Micron up 80%, Broadcom up 60%, Qualcomm up 57%, First Solar up 50%. And then the semiconductor equipment names up 44%. Think AMAT up 52%, KLA is up 48%, Teradyne up 40%. Um, and then you got internet media up 30%. Think things like Meta, uh, expanded tech up. 27%. Home build is up 9%. Retail up 5%. Aerospace and defense up 4%. Oil and gas up 4%. The growth trade up 24%, while the value trade is up 5% year to date. What is interesting is that disruptive tech, the ARC ETF, Kathy Woods' ARC, is down 17% year to date, right? Think names like Tesla's down 25%, and they hold 12.5% of that total ETF. Uh, Roku's down 42%, Roblox down 21%, CRISPR's down 3%. Today's eco data includes initial jobless claims of plus 235,000, continuing claims of 1.8 million. We got housing starts month over month up 7 tenths of a percent, which is down from last month. We've got building permits month over month up 7 tenths of a percent which is up from last month, and finally the Philly Fed business outlook at five. Bonds did better on Tuesday. Demand for the $13 billion worth of 20-year treasuries was well received. Yields reaching 4.45%, which was down from 4.48%, which means there were buyers, right? Stock prices go up, bond yields go down. The two years yielding at 4.73%, uh, while the 10-year, uh, we left yielding 4.24. Oil's holding steady at 81.50 after piercing up and through the trend line resistance last week at 79.40. We're now in the 79.40, 85.50 trading range for oil, and it's the same story, right? summer demand to draw down oversupply and overall global uh, demand growth for energy. The recent spike um, in temperature across the U.S. last week and now the official start to the summer season, which is today, June 20th, only creating more demand for energy to cool homes and businesses, and that's only going to support energy prices at least for the next three months. Watch the utilities during this period, right? They're, they are currently the fifth best performing sector out of the 11 S&P sectors. So are, you, are we going to see them move up into the third or even the fourth position. Demand for electricity is not going away anytime soon. Uh, and guess what? Solar and wind are just not cutting it. Gold continues to churn in the 2300, 2350 range. Um, 
this as gold bugs are awaiting further clarification on the Fed's next move. Gold is up 13% year to date, reaching a high of 24.77 back on May 5th before retreating back to current levels. Foreign buyers think China and India, along with geopolitical concerns, think Ukraine and the Mideast, all driving forces behind the move in gold this year. We remain in the broader 2300-2400 trading range. This morning, U.S. futures continue to surge. Dow futures up 56. The S&P's up 22. NASDAQ by 135 and the Russell's ahead by five. The rally only proving that the AI frenzy and the strong, resilient U.S. economy are going to continue to support growth in earnings, growth in profits, and growth in margins, uh, which again causes me to ask, why are we cutting rates? Are they really that restrictive considering all this good news we're getting? NVIDIA is up, quoted up another 2.5% or $3.20 at $138.70. Think the end of the week, we got the S&P rebalancing, think the XLK and the role that NVIDIA is now going to play in that ETF as well as a whole bunch of other ones that need to mimic the performance of the NASDAQ. Recall that the NVIDIA weighting in the XLK is expected to go from 6% to 20%, and that's just one ETF. And while the change has already begun, Expect to see, you know, a big opening and closing print as we move into Friday when it becomes official. The Russell rebalancing actually takes place the following Friday. So expect lots of activity uh, the following Friday as well. European markets are all higher. The Swiss National Bank, uh, in fact, cut rates for the second time in 2024, taking them uh, from 1.5% down to one and a quarter percent, a move that was expected by economists and analysts, leaving the Swiss National Bank as the front runner in the global policy the easing cycle, right? The Bank of England is due to uh, announce their decision today. And in fact, by all accounts, they were expected to do nothing. And that's exactly what they did. They kept rates unchanged, leaving them at five and a quarter percent. But investors are waiting to hear about the future guidance on a possible rate cut come August. Yesterday, the UK uh, reported that their annual inflation rate in May was 2% bang, hanging right on the bank's target. At 6.30 uh, this morning, markets across the Eurozone were all up better than a half a percent, with Italy up 1.2 percent, keeping it the best performing country in the Eurozone at plus 10.7 percent year to date. The S&P ended at 54.71, up, not, up uh, 13 points, leaving us just 19 points away from the next century mark. And if futures remain positive, we can expect that that's going to happen at 9.31 in the morning. The VIX, right, the fear index, remains at historic lows, currently at 1253, well below all three trend lines and very much in the complacency camp with almost no chance of spiking higher at the moment because uh, there does not appear to be any negative catalyst yet, which is exactly why you need to remain vigilant because you never know what could suddenly pop up and ignite a fire to the downside. The real next piece of uh, revealing debt is going to be next Friday's PCE deflator report, right? The Fed's favorite inflation gauge, and that's expected to show a slowdown, which will only keep the rate cut narrative on the front burner, right? As they, as they continue to argue that we need a cut, we need a cut, we need a cut. Next Thursday, the 27th, brings us the first national presidential debate. And while that's not going to drive stock prices, it will certainly uh, create some entertainment value. So sit tight as we get ready for that. Remember, having a plan is key for the long-term investor. And while the surge uh, higher is great, emotional FOMO decisions are never a good idea. Give me a call to discuss because I'm always happy to have a uh, uh, conversation with you about long-term planning and creating generational wealth. Okay, so what do we have for dinner tonight? Well, in Italian, it's spaghetti con salsa di cipolle cremolata vidalia, which is sweet vidalia onion sauce. Oh my God, I put these pictures on Twitter yesterday because I made this yesterday afternoon, had it, it was delicious. Right, so this is so good. And by the way, once you make the caramelized vidalia onions, you can use them on so many other things as well besides just this, this particular dish. So for this, you need the vidalia onions. You know, you need them peeled and sliced. You need butter. You need olive oil. You need salt and pepper. You need egg, three egg yolks. You need fresh grated parmigiana cheese and one pound of spaghetti or linguine or whatever pasta you choose to use. Begin by adding a stick of butter to a, uh, and a splash of olive oil to a large saute pan uh, and then take all the onions that you've chopped and put them in the pan. You put it on medium high, get the pan nice and hot. And once the pan gets hot, then turn it down to medium, medium low and then let them caramelize the onions, right? Constantly turning them. It's to take you 40 45 minutes or so make sure to be turning the onions though as they're caramelizing to get a nice golden toasty color all over 
Now, while this is happening, you can put a pot of salted water on the back burner and just bring it up to a slow boil so that it's ready when you need it. Once the onions are caramelized, remove them off the heat. Just let them cool a little bit. Then you're going to add, uh, you're going to put those in the food processor. You're going to add three egg yolks and a handful, one or two, of a fresh grated Parmigiana cheese. In fact, I just grated it right into the, uh, right into it. And then I, and then I, uh, and then I blended it, right? Made it pureed. Then I took the pasta, I added it to the pot of water. I cooked it for eight minutes or so because you want it al dente, right? When the pasta is cooking though, you want to take a, a ladle of that pasta water, which is also known as Tears of the Gods, right? And add it to the onion mixture just to keep it thin a little bit. Don't make it watery, just thin it out a little bit. Now using the same saute pan that you used, put the onion sauce now back into the pan. And when the pasta is done using tongs, add the pasta directly into the saute pan as well. You're probably gonna to need to add another ladle of the pasta water to the saute pan to keep the pasta moist. You wanna serve this in warm bowls and you wanna dust it with fresh grated Parmigiana cheese on top and enjoy this with a side of toasted garlic bread and a chilled white wine or even a rosé now that it's summertime. A side note, like I already told you, once you make this, uh, the, 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 the sauce, you can put it in the fridge and you can use it on grilled chicken, grilled pork chops, you can even use it on sliced steak. I mean, be creative. They're sweet caramelized Vidalia onions. There's nothing bad about them. In any event, it goes with everything, but with this pasta, you will enjoy it, right? You don't have to have a lot of it. It's a you have a little taste. You're gonna love the sweetness of the onions uh, mixed with the cheese. It's just, it's just a delicious dish. Until tomorrow, take good care.